we go. Where did I? Right, so yeah, I'm Hen Abbott. I'm a highways engineer with a background in highways maintenance, and I'm currently working in development management with Gloucestershire County Council. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. We have had an exceptionally high number of registrations for this event, showing how important the subject is. And this afternoon, we will hear from three highly regarded professionals who will talk us through the subject from the viewpoint of healthy streets, healthy trees, and how street trees have been included in the updated manual for streets. By way of introduction, I want to try and share, please bear with me, it's not my, not, not really my skill set, I'm going to try and share just a couple of images with you. Um, so, so the photo on the left here shows a tree lined street as it is today, which was planted in the 1960s. And on the right, there's a clip from a current planning application. So this is a planning application which is on a public portal and it is current. I think it has just been decided or it's about to be decided. So it's bang up to date. Um, they're not, they're, they're representative of some of the concerns that we have with highway streets. I'm not gonna tell you where they are because it doesn't actually matter. They're not linked geographically. They're actually from two completely different counties. Um, and I'm sure you can all find similar examples of this in your local area. So the National Planning Policy Framework now actively encourages the inclusion of trees in the street scene, but there appears little collective understanding on how best to design and deliver these without compromising users, such as cyclists and pedestrians, particularly vulnerable pedest pedestrians, um, compromising the footway and the carriageway itself, and quite often compromising the trees themselves. There is also some confusion over the definition of streets and roads, and in the absence of other definitive guidance, many highway authorities are still turning to the yeah. design manual for roads and bridges. <laughs> guidance on roads outside of um, <laughs> We hope today's webinar will help shed some light on these issues. Um, so I'll just try and stop sharing that. Okay. Before I hand over to our first speaker, I just want to quickly explain the format on questions. So please put your question in the chat. So we may be able to combine a few similar questions or we may invite you to ask your question yourself. So please feel free to like a question because this will help us gauge how popular it is. There will be a few minutes after each speaker for key specific questions. There will be a much longer Q&A session with all speakers at the end. We would like to see you, so if you, and we do encourage interaction, so please feel free to turn your camera on, particularly for the question sessions, um, but please do remain on mute unless you are invited to speak. So I'm delighted to hand over to Annabel Keegan, our first speaker, who will introduce herself and let me try and... Hi everybody, I um, hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, my name's Annabelle Keegan, I'm an Associate Director at PJA. So I lead our uh, placemaking team here in our Birmingham office. So I've been asked to give a bit of an introduction to you today. So I'm going to talk to you about a piece of work that I've been working on for about 18 months called Streets for a Healthy Life. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get cracking. So um, this kind of first session um, is just to set the scene really in terms of why healthy streets are a good starting point for design. So I'm really pleased by the number of people that are on the call today because I think it's testament to the fact of how important um, this uh, topic is on the current agenda. And it's something that um, is kind of very passionate to me as a designer and we work very hard on as a practice um, in terms of our placemaking and engineering delivery. So as we all know, design quality is very much back at the national agenda. We're uh, seeing local authority expecting really much higher design aspirations and design expectations from, um, from planning teams and design teams. And very much what we're seeing in terms of delivery, and I don't know whether you guys feel the same, but there's very much room for improvement so the national planning policy framework um, is, is um, helping us as designers to set a framework um, for assessment and also um, a toolkit by which we can engage with uh, planning applications through the design process. And one of these tools is a, a, a framework that I'm sure you'll all be aware of called Building for a Healthy Life. Now, Building for a Healthy Life for many years has been around in a number of guises, probably you heard it as Building for Life 12, um, and it went through a refresh um, 
in 2020 to be rebadged as Building for a Healthy Life. And the rationale for that was it was sponsored this time around by the National Health Service. And it was very much to try and put healthy lifestyles and healthy living at the heart of street, uh, street design, um, very much for uh, new residential neighbourhoods and homes and public spaces. So our chairman, Phil Jones, was one of the co-authors for, for Building for a Healthy Life, and it very much uses the 12-point structure that was at the heart of BFL 12, as it was originally, um, originally set out. But as I mentioned, it was uh, done in partnership with Homes England and the National Health Service. Um, and the rationale for the design for the changes to the document was around reflecting changes to legislation that came through uh, the planning system. And and also um, reflecting a um, three-year programme called the Healthy New Towns programme, which was led by NHS England. So Phil was involved um, along with uh, a number of other uh, key practitioners, and he um, inputted a lot of um, information around, particularly around design for new uh, residential streets. So BHL uses a 12 consideration, um, working all the way through from the macro scale of good urban design through to the micro scale of delivering in develop individual elements, including bins and cycle storage, and using a kind of green light system that sets through a golden thread through planning and development. So it works all the way through from integrated neighbourhoods through to distinctive places down to streets for all. Now, um, BHL has been used for a number of years, but what I was finding as an assessor was that um, a lot of the criteria within BHL were failing quite miserably on um, the streets and healthy lifestyle aspects. The um, planning applications that were coming forward uh, were really struggling to get to grips with what was required from designers in terms of how to create a healthy place and um, places that are well designed um, and well planned for healthy lifestyles. So um, what we did was uh, uh, kind of looking back through BHL, um, we looked at kind of the references that were made in here and tried to identify gaps within the document in terms of where further explanation was required. So um, what we did was pitch an idea to Homes England to pre pre prepare a companion guide to building for a healthy life, which we called Streets for a Healthy Life. And the purpose of the document was to try and show good practice about what could be achieved in terms of the adopted highway, which first and foremost put people, in play, uh, people at the heart of new placemaking. So be that for better um, streets for socialization, better streets for movement, better streets for biodiversity, and also better to streets for kind of water quality and surface runoff. So um, about um, 18 months ago now, you may, have, um, you may have seen there was a big call for information. Um, and I was very kindly helped by a number of people that are on this call to pull together a really nice selection of good case studies. Um, also in parallel to this, um, myself and Phil have been having regular conversations with the team that are pulling together the new manual for streets. And uh, I won't dwell on that because Sally's going to give us a far more thorough update on what's happening with that. But we've been working closely with them to um, um, talk kind of back and forth about what the new manual for streets will include and how in the interim building uh, um, building for life and streets for a healthy life could help to fill that gap so building on kind of the red amber green light system we've used the same approach within streets for a healthy life so what we do is basically go through a series of UK step case studies and we give annotated and dimensioned photographs and show examples of both good and bad practice um, we um, we praise and name the good examples, um, but we don't shame the bad examples. So you may recognise some of them, but we've purposely chosen to not uh, name the bad examples within the document. So at the moment, um, the document is in what we call a beta testing stage. Um, and the rationale for that is that Homes England have only at the moment funded the first part of the document. Um, and we are trying to kind of emphasize the, the role that streets have um, and basically the, them being the most underutilized assets within our public spaces within our cities and really trying to put emphasis on how the quality of street design and particularly public spaces can have a huge impact on the quality of the places that we deliver. 
So um, just kind of setting the scene in terms of where we are and, and what's informed um, Streets for Healthy Life. We've obviously seen, and I'm sure you're all aware of the, the big changes that we've seen in um, new policy and guidance that's come out from government in the last 18 months. So we saw right at the start of COVID, uh, decarbonising transport, which was uh, published by DFT, um, accompanied by about £2 billion worth of investment in um, walking and cycling infrastructure. We also saw the publication of Gear Change, which is the policy document and then guidance set out the cycle infrastructure design in local transport note 120 and all of these documents have been embedded into building for a healthy life but what we were finding in terms of assessments of schemes was that people didn't really understand what uh, a compliant scheme looked like. So we've gone back and we've um, kind of backfilled and tried to um, provide some more guidance around those aspects. And then also trying to take into consideration what has happened with the National Design Guide and also the National Model Design, Design Code. So Streets for a Healthy Life, as I mentioned, uh, that's the front cover for it. It's in beta testing stage at the moment. So um, getting something published on a .gov website is incredibly complicated, uh, as we're finding as a team. So in the interim, the TDAG has kindly been hosting um, the beta testing part one document for that. So at the end of my presentation, there's a link to, to download that. Um, and um, basically what we've done is we've built on the principal functions of streets that were set out in Manual for Streets all the way back to kind of to 2010, working through place movement access um, and then um, parking, drainage, street utilities and street lighting. And we've tried to incorporate all of those aspects. So the colours that we've chosen are based on Homes England branding. So what we use those colours all the way through to reference those principal functions of streets. So what we've done is we've taken a series of um, standard street typologies um, and we have um, basically looked at the component features of streets and started to identify when those street features will always be found, typically be found, sometimes or rarely. And then we've used this information within here to um, set out a series of good practice examples, as I mentioned. What we've also tried to do as well is think about the process, because what we what we think as designers is often the um, uh, agencies such as Homes England are involved in the early kind of pre-planning um, process or perhaps up to outline planning consent. But as things go through um, highways approval or through cut through to detailed design, elements that are often set out as aspirations through planning applications, such as the one that Hen showed at the start, um, details then fall away as the reality of that, um, the delivery of those elements, be those active travel or um, street trees, seem to fall away because they haven't been considered uh, thoroughly at the early stages of design. Um, so what we've done within this document is set out a commitment, in this case, for Homes England to be involved all the way through into the post permission detailed design and highways adoption process. So in terms of the street typologies that we cover, we go through main and principal streets, we talk about secondary streets, tertiary streets, and also the ever complicated and one that often goes wrong in my experience are edge lanes and uh, private driveways. So we take, as I say, the colourway that was set out in the Homes England palette, and we've taken a series of case studies. So this is the Chase, um, which is the new hall in Harlow, as an example of a principal street. And we have broken down, kind of in terms of good practice, the elements and the components of that street. Um, we've also done a bit of digging in the background in terms of um, um, elements that have informed uh, the master plan, such in terms of the wider street structure, or in this case, the green infrastructure and how it's all knitted together. And we started to break down the components for how those pieces of the jigsaw fit together with dimensioned um, 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 elements on that. So the intention is that um, this part one is a later date accompanied by part two. So I'm hoping that now we're into the new financial year, we'll be able to start again on that project once Homes England has found some additional funding. But we will then take these same case studies and produce a series of technical drawings to accompany them that show how in reality these examples have been delivered. Um, 
in terms of the case studies that we've pulled together, not all of them are entirely good practice. So where we have um, got other photographs, we've also highlighted elements where BHL or new policy uh, would require uplift in terms of the standards. So for example, on this um, case study, it is a shared use footway cycleway. But if you were designing that under the new, um, the new uh, policy requirements under LTM 120, the level of traffic that would be, um, that is currently on um, the chase in Harlow would actually warrant a, a segregated cycle track in this instance so it's highlighting those changes where um, um, uplift in policy is required uh, change in the design process so we've also then referenced that with a series of uh, location plans to show where that street is found within the master plan and then some uh, photographs and um, some examples of um, kind of lessons learned from the designers so Roger Evans was very helpful and he's given us um, some information relating to the chase in terms of how the flexible ground floor consents at Harlow helped to support uh, the um, uh, street life and kind of change of uses on the on the main streets. And then we've also taken some examples where um, we've picked out um, um, kind of elements of uh, things, as I say, that would have needed to change under the current uh, policy regime, such as this example in Upton in Northamptonshire, and also Trumpington Meadows, where there is lack of any protected space for cycling. So hopefully, um, as you go through, you'll be able to kind of use this as a toolkit. But um, if any of you have uh, used it already or are not familiar with it, um, we would love to have your feedback. So I'm working on this with Amy Burbage, who leads the master development team at, within Homes England. Um, and we really want this this document to be a kind of a living working document so as I say it's only in its beta testing stage at the moment so we would very much love your feedback on it and um, whether you find it useful what you'd like to see included whether it goes far enough um, and whether you have got any good good other case studies that you would like to see included that would also be helpful so my last few slides are just some other examples of the different street types that within here. So this is uh, Derwent Way, which is in Derwent Thorpe in York. This is a public transport corridor. So often um, we, uh, we don't see on-street parking. So what we've done again on this one is to um, break down the street into its component parts. So the functions of the streets um, shown how uh, street trees have been included with um, on-street parking, in this case, allocated on-street parking, which we found is quite unusual. Then we've done Checkham Street in Poundbury, um, uh, an example um, uh, which is quite interesting because it's got a variable street width along its length, which we often don't see. And I think it's quite interesting in creating character. We've also um, looked at Trent Basin up in Nottingham. Um, this is an example of a Muse Street, which uh, links to, um, uh, uh, to the Trent Basin at the end of the street there with some filtered permeability for walking and cycling. Um, we've also included some examples from Trumpington Meadows in Cambridge, which sets out some excellent good practice in terms of walking and cycling, filtered permeability. Um, it's um, got some um, really interesting kind of integration of existing landscape along the edges of the site and good practice around that, how that can be achieved. Um, and then our coming scene part, just to kind of round off my presentation, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through that. But um, in terms of coming soon. Uh, we're going to be looking at, the, as I say, the detailed street features and starting to produce those in either plan form, section or axonometric as appropriate. So at the moment, our list is likely to include carriageway and vehicle track widths, uh, different types of junctions, uh, designing for public transport, um, parking on plot and off plot, um, um, examples of footway and cycle facility design, trees, uh, which Jim, one of our speakers today, has been helping us with, and also suds. So that's kind of where we are with things. Um, and so kind of putting that into the design toolkit that's available to you, we've got now kind of sitting alongside Streets for a Healthy Life and the National Model Design Code. We've got our companion Streets for a Healthy, Healthy Life. Um, and also, as Sally's going to be talking to us about shortly, the upcoming Manual for Streets, which I'm sure, like me, you're all looking to hear about today. So our document is available as a, a download on um, that link there. It's on the, the main TDAD page. I'm sure it's uh, if you just Google Streets for a Healthy Life, it will take you straight to it so that's it from me that was a very quick whistle stop tour through where we've got to so i will stop sharing and uh, hand back to him thank you annabelle that was really really interesting it's lovely to see such a document that gives you good practice and bad practice um, we see quite a lot of documents that tell you how things should be done but 
to see how they shouldn't be done as well. I think he's really informative and to look at the difference and see how things can be changed. Um, so I'm now gonna hand over to uh, Sue and Emma for a very, very quick question session specifically for Annabelle's talk. Okay, um, so I'm busy admitting people at the same time. So just going back, um, so Paul had um, an interesting question, Paul Chatfield, about how can we save space for future tree planting in existing streets in the context of gigabyte infrastructure rollout and the existing system for licensing for utilities. City Fibre is currently digging up Chichester where he lives. Um, there is a sort of, I won't half, I'll half answer the question actually, because there is a real issue with trees and utilities. And just to let you know that Trees and Design Action Group and the Urban Design Group are working with the National Geospatial Commission, because we think, and I'd like to pose it to this audience, we think that we need a national underground design code to go with the model design code, because unless we can sort out what's happening below ground, we can't actually resolve what's happening above ground successfully. Annie, I don't know if you've got anything you'd add to that. Um, not really on retrofit. So Streets for a Healthy Life only looks at new residential streets rather than kind of retrofit. So it's not something that I'm particularly involved in as a practitioner. Um, we do look at, to a degree on new residential streets because often what we find is that um, certainly as Hen showed on a plan that you get and Fiona that's on the call with me has been part of the assessment group on some of the schemes that we've been seeing for, for Homes England. Um, and we often see um, outline planning applications that are coming forward with trees all over them but the reality is actually when you do um, you come to the detailed design that enough space hasn't been left. The other thing that we're finding as uh, kind of assessors as well that's often going wrong is um, that trees aren't being put within the adopted highway so developers are putting them onto master plans within private space um, which is um, not what is advised through uh, streets, uh, streets for a Healthy Life or Building for a Healthy Life. Somebody just put into the, the chat window, do people use NJUG for utilities? Yes, very much. That's what, exactly what we use. But often the, the difficult bit is where kind of wider streets meet narrow streets and what happens on the cross sections for um, the junctions. So one of the things that we want to address in part two is looking at some of those cross sections and seeing what happens, not only kind of above ground, but what happens below ground. So that can be tried to be protected in the future because it's a real bugbear of mine that kind of that, that doesn't get through followed through to detailed design that whilst the kind of the aspiration is there at outline planning application, the engineers then become the, the the bad guys because they haven't been left enough space to fit all of these elements in. And for new developments, we'd obviously like to see shared some some organisation of utilities, wouldn't we? Shared utility ducts or something, so we don't have this crazy sort of hit and miss world that we're in at the moment when we try and retrofit. Yes. And um, Jim, you're on the call. Jim Smith and Njug, do you have anything useful yeah. that you'd add there? Because there's things in the wings. Uh, only uh, only that um, there are moves afoot uh, to approach the National Joint Utilities Group um, to, to revisit NJUG Volume 4, which is the most recent iteration, iteration of NJUG. And that's linked to the government's manifesto commitments on getting more trees in streets. And I think colleagues in, in DLUC and DEFRA have now acknowledged that um, to, to be able to achieve that, we need better quality, or more, more I wouldn't say better quality, sorry, uh, more updated uh, guidance from the utilities and an acceptance and acceptance that um, trees and utilities have to coexist in the future. If we're going to have both in our cities, we need to uh, work out a way of getting them to to cohabit that that, that uh, footway space or uh, on new developments separate them so that, um, as you mentioned, Sue, that those um, uh, uh, utility connections are put into their own service ducts and it's planned well in advance. Uh, the problem is within the planning system at the minute, um, utility connections to new developments are usually um, dealt with well after the planning permission has been granted, aren't they? So um, that's certainly been my experience in the past. So, but it is being looked at. Yes, it's something that's in 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 the mix, and uh, hopefully, um, we'll be able to persuade the appropriate authorities that it needs to be done. So. Okay, so I'm going to make, I'm going to look down some of these questions. I think will come up in the more general discussion. So I'll hand back to to hen because i think we can press on yeah I and mean, that, that's a i think the the questions that we've just had there are perhaps another seminar all, all by itself it's a massive um subject 
and it does we do need to get it right otherwise we're going to be continually designing things that don't work which is rather sad um so I'll, I'll now hand on to Jim who you've just briefly seen um who's going to talk to us about trees right. thank you very much Hannah. I'll try and share my screen and hopefully that will work oh no hang on I'm going to stop sharing. I've just pressed the wrong thing. I want to try again. Hang on. There. Right. Can you see that? I can see yes. you, Jim. You might want to press F5. Can you see the... It should be up there now. Hang on. Is it you not there? From beginning yep. and then press from beginning and then it should... Yep. How's that? Yep. Great. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, my name's Jim Smith. I'm uh, Forestry Commission's National Urban Forestry Advisor, and I'm here to talk to you today about um, planting and maintaining uh, street trees in urban areas. And um, with a sort of like a little taster of, um, we've been working with the Trees and Design Action Group and others on on uh, guidance and also um, a decision matrix. I, unfortunately, I can't show you the actual uh, thing that we've been working on because it's a, it's fairly complicated, doesn't lend itself to slides. So what I've done is just deconstruct that slightly uh, into a set of slides and um, hopefully all will become clear as we go through them. So um, in urban areas worldwide, tree planting and tree retention, so uh, retaining existing trees, um, is almost always dictated by human development, whether that's being existing development that's there already or proposed development. And I started work as a local authority uh, tree officer in 1986, I think it was, um, as I was the tree inspector in, in Hillingdon Council. And the then ARB officer was um, uh, of the view that we would never, ever be able to persuade highway engineers to, to do what we wanted to do in terms of protecting trees or, or looking after them. It was always the case that they had primacy in that space in the highway. Uh, but we've come a long way since then. Um, and the trees are pretty ubiquitous in the uh, in urban areas. They cover all the different end use categories. And one of the most important ones is highways. And the biggest issue for planting and maintaining trees in urban areas and on highways is accommodating the desired future growth of the trees. So we want them, when we plant them, we want them to grow. That's the purpose of them being there. But because cities are artificial creations and trees are living, breathing organisms that require the same basic needs as humans to, to, to survive and thrive, we need to... Uh, do a lot for them. They need space, water, air, light and nutrients, just like people. But unlike buildings, roads and urban infrastructure, they do not remain static. They grow, they change their state and their needs and requirements alter over time as they get bigger. Uh, so uh, Hen quite rightly said uh, 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 that we need to have a collaborative approach and that's something that the Trees and Design Action Group has always uh, championed. Uh, and from uh, uh, my perspective, we should really urban forest should be perceived and strategically managed as a single resource covering the whole of an area and integrated into all its land use categories and their functions, highways being one of them. So each local authority should have a tree and woodland strategy that's co-created and endorsed by all its individual departments. And that sets localised tree canopy cover targets. And that's been mentioned about trying to get. Um, I don't go into a lot of detail on in terms of tree pruning uh, in this in this. Um, uh, presentation, but uh, my colleagues in Natural England are currently working on GI standards, green infrastructure standards, and one of those um, proposed ones, which will be um, published in uh, the latter part of 2022, in November 22, will be um, uh, suggesting tree canopy cover targets at local level. So trees and woodlands should be differentiated from other green infrastructure as well, uh, and it should have, uh, they should have equal status and parity with this and other built infrastructure, so equal par parity of status with transport, utilities, and the built environment. And in, in, in my view, that will then uh, deal with some of the issues we just talked about in terms of utilities and NJUG, getting trees accommodated in those documents. So uh, there was a report produced in 2013 in support of the Big Tree Plant, which was then the government's um, flagship tree planting scheme. And it's called the barriers and drivers to tree planting and retention in urban areas. And a couple of them, which were highlighted for the purposes of this talk, uh, were local highway authority policy and, and PFI contracts in relation to adopted highway. That's always been a problem. Uh, and that was highlighted as it being a big barrier. Also, car parking provision, uh, not just on, on new developments, but also in, in pre-existing ones where we've now got... Um, vehicle drive-ins, vehicle run-ins are permitted development now, so which 
creates a problem for trees on the streets outside those properties. So we've had a lack of integrated planning process, poorly specified PFI contracts and perceptions of damage, direct or indirect, and conflict with utilities, conflict with highway provision, uh, and a lot of misinformation as well. Um, but I'd like to just draw, we will, uh, uh, I think Anne's already mentioned the National Planning Policy Framework, I'd like to draw your attention to a paragraph 131. Um, and it's interesting that this, um, uh, I've quoted this quote here, but earlier on in the paragraph, it goes on about ensuring that this long-term maintenance uh, of securing those trees in the street is considered for the future. But the bit I'd like to draw your attention to is this quote here, which is also from paragraph one, which is applicants and local planning authorities should work with highway officers and tree officers to ensure that the right trees are planted in the right place and solutions are found that are compatible with highway standards and the needs of different users. And that, uh, I think I'm right in saying that that's the, the very first time in any serious national planning, uh, government planning guidance or planning document where uh, highway officers and tree officers are name checked in the same paragraph uh, and uh, with an exhortation that they work together with local planning authorities and, the, and uh, developers to actually achieve a better outcome for trees and also for highways as well. That's an, imp an important development. Um, this document uh, was produced called the Urban Tree Manual. It was produced in support of the Urban Tree Challenge Fund, and that's got some really good, if you go to that, for, uh, that uh, website, Forest Research website, that's got some really good information on establishing trees and getting uh, the processes you need to go through in terms of uh, getting better quality of tree planting in the future. Um, we're also working on an operations note, uh, a Forest Commission's operations note uh, 051, called Highway Tree Management was, that was produced as a result of the issues that you may know occurred in Sheffield a few years ago. And the FC, the Forest Commission was uh, asked to look at that in terms of um, uh, investigating whether or not there'd been breaches of the felling license regime uh, for legislation. And we, uh, FC was tasked with producing this note, uh, Operations Note 51, which gives some guidance on uh, those engineering solutions that were mentioned earlier. Uh, so that trees, mature trees and uh, uh, highways can coexist into the future. And that's currently being produced with TDAG, uh, um, uh, the London Tree Officers Association and others. Um, uh, and that's going to be produced as supplementary guidance to manual for streets, but I'll, I'll let Sally talk about that a bit later. Uh, but that's being worked on at the moment. We'll have, as I said, have some really clear guidance um, on uh, sort of the, the practical aspects of doing that. I've got some, some illustrations from that later on in the talk, but I'll just work my way through that. We've also got the England Tree Trees Action Plan, which is um, sort of underpins uh, all this work uh, in terms of government's aspirations for um, what it wants to do for trees, better for trees in, in the urban space uh, in the future going forward. We've got, as already been mentioned, we've got the National Model Design Code, and then the guide, design guide that goes, uh, guidance for notes on design codes, which goes with that, all exhorting people to put more trees into urban spaces. And the idea is that um, as in terms of that, that, that operations note that I mentioned, it really starts, the starting point is street hierarchy, as, as Hen mentioned earlier. So we've got primary, secondary, local and tertiary streets, but it's all about location, location, location as well. So what space is available above and below ground what are the site conditions, so soils, substrate, and microclimate in that particular area? Uh, what is the local context as well? Uh, are you wanting to define and create a new sense of place or blend into the existing one if you're planting on an existing street? What tree species fits your site? So um, we are going to have to change the species that we use in our urban areas. I mean, traditionally, um, uh, trees in urban areas have been planted from all over the world. They've used exotics. Um, but the, uh, increasingly, we're going to have to plant for resilience as well in terms of what uh, the, the climate is going to be like in the future. And also, critically, what can you afford to do and how much can you do to create rooting volume space? Or is that volume, that rooting volume space, already available and adjacent to the tree pit? I mean, we shouldn't forget the trees have evolved for millions of years um, being able to exploit um, uh, their local environment and look for... Uh, resources and water and nutrients and aerated soil, that sort of thing. So if it's there, they'll find it. Uh, and what we need to do in terms of creating those better places for trees to be in our highways is to make sure that the highway can still function, but the tree can also get what it needs to grow and thrive. Uh, I've got some illustrations here. Now, I'm using these illustrations from the forthcoming operations note, but they are subject to amendment. So please um, bear that in mind in terms of the, they, they haven't yet got um, scales or sizes on. Uh, and one of the questions in the chat was about um, some um, 
so, uh, you know, dimensions for pit size and things like tree pit size. So we're working on that. But that's what we'll do. So this is a curbside build out. And that's, that's an illustration of one that might, uh, this is in Frankfurt. And there are a better, uh, other examples in, in, in England as well. Uh, this is a trench fill. And that's one down in uh, London of Islington, which is the parade of lights where those trees on the left, the ones on the right were pre-existing, ones on the left were put in. And then we've got some topical uh, repairs to the surface. So some root pruning around the base of the flared root bases of some very large mature trees, which were then um, accommodated with some rubber crumb paving. So they've extended the pit size and created that space there, which is still um, uh, user friendly for the, from the point of view of pedestrians. Uh, and also flexible pit sizes elsewhere. Uh, and then curbside build outs as well. So if you've got a tree, which is a large mature tree, which is causing problems, um, you can do a curbside build line as is done in the case and you might lose a car parking space, but that's one of the practical engineering solutions that is open to you. Um, also, you can um, have um, a, a narrower curb edge. So if you've got a tree which is causing problems um, uh, again, with its, its flared root or its, its just natural growth is starting to push out the curb, you can actually um, create a narrower curb edge uh, and that just helps to accommodate the tree in that way. And on this one, you've also got some asphalt uh, insert on the left-hand side. So some root pruning has been done here and, and then the, the footway made a bit more um, uh, user-friendly and that's from obviously for existing trees. Uh, we've also got um, the possibility, um, this was mentioned in um, Manual for Streets um, 2, which was um, uh, the one which was produced, I think, in 2010, the, the possibility of um, uh, deviating the footway around an obstacle, around a tree from the point of view of um, inclusive mobility, etc. So that's one of the drawings that will be in uh, our new document. Uh, and this is an example of that, where you've got a tree, a pre-existing tree, which is obviously slap bang in the middle of a, uh, a footway. Uh, historically, why it was there, I don't know. but. Um, what the local authority, this local authority has decided to do um, a road, uh, sort of like a, a build out, footway build out, and put the, um, so retain the tree, but do a build out there so that the pedestrians can still use that space. And then uh, some of the more, much more, shall we say, um, uh, larger interventions in terms of central reservation planting. This is um, Holloway Road down uh, in uh, the north of London, where um, some very large uh, works were done in terms of getting some street trees down the centre of the road centre preservation. And that took a long time to produce. I did that when I was um, at one of Islington as the uh, local authority planning tree officer. It took us about two years to persuade the then highways agency to let us do that. And we went through lots of hoops doing um, underground surveys and uh, safety audits, but it can be done. So as long as you um, uh, try and work with your highway engineers uh, and uh, accommodate them in terms of what they're asking you to do. You can get some good outcomes from that. And this is a much, as I say, a much more uh, radical intervention where you're doing some very good uh, subterranean work or you're creating rooting volume space. And this was uh, the angel, but the angel, uh, the angel building uh, in North London also. And some really re excellent examples of putting some big trees in there with some good, uh, good. Um, uh, uh, accommodation of, of the root balls and also preparing the ground and preparing the tree pit so that they thrive. So in a nutshell, when it's all about location, it's looking at the street hierarchy, uh, considering what space you have above ground and also below ground critically. So how will that tree thrive as it grows into the future and its root plate starts extending? What are the site conditions? What's the context, the local context in terms of species and also the character of the area? What can you afford to do um, uh, you know, in terms of either creating rooting volume uh, for the trees that you're planting or making the, the, the substrate and soil which is available adjacent to that accessible uh, and looking at that sense of sense of place. Are you, are you uh, being true to the sense of place that you're trying to create or fitting with what's there already? And species, I've mentioned species selection, but that is also critical. And Trees Design Action Group worked with Myerscough College on their, their um, tree species selection guide, which I recommend to everybody. It's a really good um, comprehensive guide, which gives um, quite a large palette of trees to choose from uh, and some of the um, things that you need to consider when planting. Uh, also, Trees and Design Action have produced uh, Trees and Hard Landscape, which has got some great information there. Trees and Planning uh, and Development as well, which is um, part one's been published. I'm sure Sue will talk more about that. And we're um, uh, looking at producing the remaining two parts shortly. 
Um, and guidance, so just to let you know, I'm going to wrap up in a minute. Um, guidance with the decision matrix is coming soon, uh, but we'll also be giving uh, uh, that advice on engineering solutions through the operations number 51. And all these documents um, taken together will give practitioners a much better handle, as Henna suggested, on the practical aspects of what you're needing to do to get trees integrated into the highway so both can coexist. But they're not, I should add that those. Um, uh, the decision matrix when it comes out, and also operations note 51, won't be a substitute for professional horticultural advice uh, on specific um, case cases. Uh, they will be though a tool to inform planning process for achieving more and better planning process and practicalities of that for achieving more and better trees in the highway. I often use this, some of you who've seen my presentation before seen this slide, uh, this is from the London Development Plan 1951, it's Kingsway, uh, and this is the shot um, more recently taken. I put this in 2009, this shop. And the, the, when I first started using these slides, this one and this one, the difference in time between the two is about 60 years. And I used to say um, that that's about the same length of time that we have um, to um, get that canopy cover achieved, so 60 years. But now, uh, in, just in the last 10 years since I've been using this slide, that timeline has concertinaed right up. And we now know that um, climate change is hitting us a lot faster than we thought. And we've probably got less than 15 to 20 years, if that, to make a change. So it really is incumbent on it, all of us as professionals, I think, to work together um, with that, that significant goal and objective in mind, which is getting better trees into our towns and cities with um, greater canopy cover to give us all the benefits that we know that they can provide, that they can provide. That's me, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jim. That was that was really, really interesting. I mean, the decision make matrix is something I think we all need as engineers. We're quite simple people, really. We 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 sort of we like black and white. We like A, Bs, and Cs. And um, but it was also really interesting. I think you've illustrated very well that there, are, whatever your problem is, there are solutions. They're going to be. They're not necessarily the same solutions. Some of them you might think outside the box. And a lot of them will involve some compromise, maybe to say compromising a bit of carriageway width or compromising the line of a footway or compromising a parking space. Um, but there will be solutions. And I think you also started off by saying we need to raise the value of trees. They're not, um, they're not nice to have, they're an essential. And we need, you know, once we start suggesting that a tree has the same amount of value as a car parking space or a street light or a carriageway or whatever, it's part of the infrastructure, it's not just an add on. Um, so rather than waffling on, I'll just hand over to Sue and Emma again for questions. Hi, Jim. So it's fallen to me this time. So someone was just asking if we could share the last photo showing the canopy cover, please. So, yeah, I think that, that was Becky. I, um, what, what I can do is if I provide that to Sue, I'll give that, that photograph. Are you talking about the Kingsway one? Yes, please. Those last two pictures showing the difference over the 60 years. I'll, that I'll give it great. I'll give it to Sue. Uh, um, she might have them already, actually, and then she can just distribute them to, to everyone or just to you if she likes to. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Lovely. Another specific question, which I'm hoping means more to you than it does to me, is Jim It's from Mac. And it says, Jim, can you clarify the comment about PD for drop curb crossings, please? P permitted development. Uh, not no, the crossing isn't permitted development, but uh, I don't know about what it's like in Birmingham, Mac. But um, uh, certainly, people can put um, uh, hard standing on their front. You know, they can put hard standing in, can't they, um, to to make a car parking space as permitted development now. Mac, do you want to say anything? Can you say anything? Because you've joined twice. I'm wondering if you. <laughs> My apologies for that, Emma. I didn't mean to enjoy. Uh... I'm enjoying rural poverty at the moment in Derbyshire, so I apologise. No, Jim, um, as I understand it, yeah, you can tarmac the front of your house, but you certainly can't cross the footway with permitted development. No, 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 that, that still requires its consent, but um, it's permitted. What, what I found is the pressure, and that was one of the, what the barriers report found, was that a lot of people were under permitted development rights putting hard standing on the front of their house so they could park their car there. And then it, the local authorities then, as you know, would find it very difficult to refuse that. Um, some do, if, if, if there's a tree uh, that caused, but, but if you get that down, you know, if that happens a lot down a road, you're suddenly lost lots of locations where you might be able to plant a tree. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jim. And I think um, I'll just put something to you very briefly. So from following all the all the comments in the chat, and I think we'll come on to this in the broader discussion at the end, it seems to me that there isn't enough space on the street for the trees and there isn't enough space underground for the trees. What do you think about that? Is that is that a question to me, Emma? <laughs> I think so. Just a, I think, that, yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, we'll take I that think, discussion uh, later. Well, I think, what I think about that is, um, depends what sort of tree you want to plant, really, doesn't it? Um, I, I obviously, T Dang's main. No, they've um, left. They've only got a pallet, and you said Hang it's. I've sorted it. Go on. Okay, yeah. It really depends. I, I think, um, depending on, on the location of the street, as I say, what, what is the hierarchy of the street that you're talking about? You can get, you can get significantly sized trees into some big primary streets, and I've done that myself. Obviously, there's problems with utilities. When you go back down to suburban and very small side streets, that's also an issue. But um, when, when we were doing the, the Mayor's Street Tree Planting Programme in London, there was very few locations that we couldn't get some, some scale of tree in. Uh, and uh, I think what I would like to see happen, as we already alluded to it now, is much more ro robust um, championing of trees um, from, from government in terms of dealing with other urban infrastructure providers, so utilities, et cetera, that sort of thing. Um, they've got, you know, they're all statutory undertakers, aren't they, sort of thing. So what we really need is, um, is a much more robust attitude. If we want trees, and I think government does want trees in, in our urban streets, um, then we've got to uh, accommodate that by giving them that parity of status with those, those other types of infrastructure. Because when I first started as a, as a tree inspector in Hillingdon over 30 years ago, as I said, uh, we were very much the second, not even the second cousin, the third cousin when once removed. Uh, and we didn't get a look in. I think it's changing now. I think things are becoming much more positive, but it's a sort of a slow uphill. You're pushing that 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 weight uphill to get it over the top, and we're nearly there. We just need all practitioners to acknowledge that. Okay, if we do want more tree canopy, more trees, and more tree canopy cover in our urban centres, how do we do it? And the solutions are there. We just need to think, you know, think um, uh, much harder about what to do and how to do it. I knew you'd have something positive to say, Jim. So um, I think we'll just leave the questions there now and move straight on to Sally, and then we can pick up all these things again at the end, because there's lots of great stuff coming through in the chat um, about working with developers and utilities. So that was brilliant, Jim. Hen, did you want to? Uh, I, yeah, I was, I was just going to um, thank Jim, thank the questions that there are. I've noticed a few questions popping up about funding, which I think is um, something which we will probably not be able to avoid talking about at the end. We might have to give that some time. Um, but just before we do that, I'm going to pass over to Sally Gibbons, who's going to talk to us about updating manual for streets. Hello, everyone. Can you can you hear me? One nod. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'll just share my screen if I uh, let's see if I can get the slides up. Uh, Right. Is that working? Can you see that? Can people see that? Great. Thank you. I'm not used to using Zoom, so um, if this goes wrong, I'm, sorry, you just I'm very sorry. Full, can you just make it yeah. full screen? I will do that. Uh, slideshow from beginning. OK. Has that worked? Yeah, that looks yeah. great, Sally. Great. I can't see anything else. I can only see that. So <laughs> sorry, I feel like I'm shouting into void. Anyway, um, right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sally Gibbons. I am the head of the traffic signs and street design policy team at the Department of Transport. Um, and the street design bit of that is the, the relevant bit for today, which is sort of a policy on um, how the how the road is divvied up between different uses, different modes of transport um, and so on. And among many other things, we are leading on the update to the manual for streets. Um, which uh, is of great interest to, to many people. So I'll try and cover the sort of um, wider policy context that uh, streets, the street trees can sit within, um, but also give you a bit of an idea of uh, what we're doing with the project and where we are and, and what's happening next. Um, so yeah, a bit of background just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page, but you, I'm sure most of you will know all of this um, looking at the comments in the chat. <laughs> so yeah, streets and roads are, you know, three quarters of public spaces, they're, they're a hugely important part of, of our environment. Um, they have many functions, but in, in terms of um, movement, 
you know, it's, it's almost impossible to think of a journey where you don't use the street in some way, even if all you're doing is walking out to where you park the car or to the bus stop. Um, and streets have this crucial function in being the glue that uh, sticks all the journey, sticks journeys together. So if you can't get to the bus stop or the train station or whatever else, then you know you, you're kind of uh, stopped before you started. Um, there was a bit of discussion um, at the beginning at the beginning of today about what streets are and what they're not. And for the purposes of manual for streets, this is kind of what we're we're looking at: um, uh, streets being places more of a having a, having a strong place function. Um, as opposed to movement, I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, so, so residential areas, um, high streets, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but they're not what when you know these 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 quotes are from Manual for Streets and Manual for Streets too. So, um, I'm not going to sort of read them out. You can um, uh, read in your own time, I'm sure. But um, so we're not talking about motorways. We're not talking about big, you know, inter um, uh, suburban ring roads, that kind of thing. Um, and these are the kinds of roads where you would use manual for streets. These are not. Um, you don't want manual for streets. You don't want to design manual for roads and bridges on this, this kind of road. You don't want manual for streets on this kind of road. Sorry, I got myself mixed up there. Um, so what is the manual for streets? Um, for, the, for anyone that doesn't, doesn't know, it was our national design guidance um, published in 2007, <coughs> excuse me, primarily for residential development at the time. Um, and it sort of turned on its head quite a lot of um, established a, uh, established ideas and practices about how you design streets. Um, it was evidence-based. We did a lot of research into sort of what was appropriate, particularly around safety and visibility displays at junctions. Um, it's used by an, um, quite a wide, um, it's quite a wide audience for it. It kind of splits into two camps. There's the, the planning side and new development and planning and designing that. And then there's the sort of retrofit existing streets, highway side, and how you manage that manage those assets um, going forward. The, it, the original was published by us and CLG because of the, as they were, then were, because of the um, uh, planning links. Um, and in 2010, we followed it with Manual for Streets 2, which took those principles and extended them to, uh, um, to, to busier streets, high streets, town centres, that sort of thing. Um, I think there's a, there's a view from, there's a, mis, there's a misunderstanding sometimes that Manual for Streets 2 superseded MFS. It didn't, they, they worked together, they're, they're uh, complementary. Um, uh, so that said, why are we updating it? Well, um, time's gone by. It's now 15 years since it was published. Um, so stuff has changed. We've got the NPPF uh, didn't, you know, planning policy didn't exist in the same way it does now. Um, but really, the, the, the driver for us was that um, uptake isn't as high as we'd like and as it should be. So you're still getting core developments that's just sort of dominated by um, roads and uh, car travel and and this you know this kind of thing. Um, but also, it can, you know, manual for streets and streets designed to those principles can deliver all sorts of other policies and help in all sorts of other policy areas. So um, we, uh, yeah, and we were doing, we did a, um, a scoping study uh, three years ago now, uh, four years ago now, um, looking at um, what we wanted out of manual for streets, and we sort of come to the conclusion we did want a new manual for streets and so on. And just as we got agreement to go ahead and do the project proper. Um, we, the, sort of the first lockdown hit and we were all, you know, thrown up in the air and, and uh, things changed massively. But I put this slide in because one of the things that came out of that time was a realisation, I think, from a lot of people about the importance of streets, the streets local to them. Um, we saw lots more walking and cycling. Um, we saw um, you know, improvements in air quality. We saw people realising that streets that weren't dominated by motor traffic were quite nice and people were spending more time in them. Um, you know, and, and as we come out of this, and as we try and sort of find what a new normal looks like, there's lots of questions around how people are going to use streets differently, how our journey patterns will change if hybrid working is here to stay for, for a lot of people, uh, what happens to the high street, it changes its function, it's not purely about retail anymore. And so there's a, there's a, there's a really strong, this, this whole, you know, debate gave us a really strong focus for manual for streets. And it suddenly became a lot more high profile than it had been <laughs> before the pandemic. Which is, you know, a good thing, but I wish it hadn't taken a pandemic for that to be the case. Um, and really, what Manual for the Streets does is it talks about streets for people, essentially. So you've got, you know, you've got these two concepts of place and movement. I, I realise these, these these slides are the text is a little bit small on these, so please don't strain your eyes. Um, again, they're both in Manual for Streets, so do feel free to go and to go and read up. Um, and you know, the the uh, what we've done in this country for a very long time was assume that movement was the thing you had to design for, vehicle movement, motor traffic movement, 
had to be, you know, that was the king that had to be designed for at the expense of place, place being all those things um, that make a, make somewhere attractive to be in, attractive to spend time in, you want to linger in, you, you want to meet your friends, play on the street, do whatever. Um, so, you know, somewhere with a high place function is residential, um, where it's not about moving traffic through it, it's about the space, it's about being part of people's homes. High movement function is motorway, really you are just about getting the traffic through. Um, and what Manu for Street said was that place isn't subservient to movement, it's about um, it's about in the right places designing for that and not designing for motor traffic. Um, and it also includes the user hierarchy there, which we have, which is sort of considering the needs of pedestrians and cyclists first and public transport users, and basically private motor traffic at the bottom um, in places where you, you want this place function to be uh, to be preeminent. So if you're designing some manual for streets principles, then you're taking in all of these on the right hand side there, all of these kinds of development. Um, uh, which you know you can label them as, as you can you can cut the cake in as many ways as you want you can label them whatever you want but they're all kind of fundamentally streets for people um, we've heard a lot about low traffic neighborhoods in the last two years um, and the 20 minute neighborhood idea is, is gaining momentum as well um, I mentioned MFS helps with lots of different policy areas um, these are some of the things that have come out in the last two or three years um, from from the department and, and uh, DLUC um, uh, um, just to sort of illustrate the things that MFS touches on, you know, we've got somebody uh, mentioned gear change before, cycling and walking and the ambition to get 50% you know, of short urban journeys walked and cycled. Um, decarbonizing transport is a massive one if you enable more, um, if you enable more active travel and you enable environments that mean people don't travel, you know, you, it, 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 at all, you're cutting out journeys, you're helping reduce carbon. Electric vehicles are a big, big question, how do we fit the charge points into the streets another thing to add to the, the conflict of all the things that the street has to accommodate <coughs> how do you include them in a way that doesn't um, create problems for people using the pavement doesn't interfere with other other uses of the pavement how do you you know how do you do all this given the numbers of charge points that, that, that are uh, in, you know, predicted to be needed um, uh, accessibility in public realm is a big focus for us as well making sure that um, whatever you label it everyone can access it um, and inclusive mobility, that's the old cover. We've recently republished that in January this year. Um, and then we've got questions about the future of mobility. What happens with automated vehicles, with micro mobility and e-scooters coming along and all sorts of, of other things. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, lots of things that MFS and its, its ambitions and its principles touch on. And we go, we go wider, we talk about you know, planning white paper, security in the public realm, clean air. Again, if you enable you know, less journeys by, by motor traffic, then you're going to help clean up the air, um, <coughs> make people health, excuse me, make people healthier. And um, our version of the Forestry Commission's logo there, um, which is uh, um, which is what I could what I what I could find at the time to illustrate the street trees question and how we accommodate street trees within within uh, within streets. Um, the National Model Design Code, few people have touched on. Manual for streets is linked into that. We've got to deluck on our project board for the project. Um, it's really welcome that this has gone into the National Model Design Code. We are talking to them also about getting it more, more embedded within the, the framework itself, which we think will be really helpful um, in terms of um, encouraging that shift towards, towards better design. And trees, here we are, the English England Trees Action Plan, which Jim mentioned, and this is the reference in its manual for streets um, about how we, you know, how we how we work together. And we've been having We've been uh, talking to, to Jim um, from the very beginning of the process, I think, about how we can make sure that the two things link together um, so that we can uh, we can uh, we can make sure that the, the advice is there and is linked to and is going to be um, to be prominent. So that is the sort of the, the context and how all the, all the policies you know, that, that we are looking at and how we're updating it is through CIHT, who I, I know are um, sponsoring this session today, which is which is uh, very welcome. We've grant funded them to to run the projects on our behalf because, you know, they they are one of the preeminent voices of the professionals that will use the document, um, and not least they were the publishers of Manual for Streets too. So we brought we brought we brought, we've come together with them um, to to work on the the update to to both that and MFS. They've appointed WSP as contractors. We're aiming to publish later this year. There's um, some there's no doubt an enormous amount of frantic activity going on right now at WSP <laughs> to put it all together and, um, and, and get us the latest draft. Um, and this is, this is just to sort of outline a little bit of the, of the structure to it as well. 
Um, the bit that's probably going to be most, of most interest to many of you is part D, which is the details on how exactly you know you design streets, as well as we, you know we're sort of focusing on this this idea of outcomes. Look at your street. What are you trying to achieve? Then what do you need to do to that street to enable those outcomes to be achieved? Um, and in and in there in, in part D, there will be sections on green and blue infrastructure, um, including uh, trees. What we're doing um, throughout the document is to avoid it becoming you know the size of DM of the design manual for roads and bridges, which in paper form is an entire bookshelf. Um, we are sort of do, taking this signposting approach. So for all these different policy areas, I mean, to use an analogy which is possibly appropriate, I don't know. Um, the risk of manual for streets is that it's a Christmas tree. Everybody tries to hang their own policy on it, and that's great. But we need to make sure it's not overloaded and that everything is clearly can be clearly seen and 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 understood. Um, so um, what we, we what we are likely to be doing is setting out in the document the sort of overall policy picture of why why different things are important so why street trees are important we'll probably you know it might be picking up the, the, the action plan and, and manifesto commitments and other things and government policy on this but then if there's detailed guidance on a, on a subject we'll point out to that so with the operations note 51 that, that jim mentioned that'll be the link there um and we're doing this with other things cycling in class accessible public realm and, and and so on and so forth so that gives you an idea of how how exactly we're doing this <laughs> why we're doing it and what it's going to cover um that was a little bit whistle stop i think that's my last it is my last slide and there's some yes there's some birds who've got confused between a traffic light and a tree um but um but that's all from me and i'm very happy to take questions um and uh, and get into a bit of a discussion if that's yeah that's it from me thank you I'll stop sharing now and I can see you all. Thank you, Sally. That was a, a really useful um, conclusion, I think, as well to our series of presenters. And the thing that's really struck me through all those presenters, but oh, Sally sort of pulled it all together, is the absolute need for collaboration and how we shouldn't be looking at street trees as an item all in their own. They're part of the street scene and we maybe need to start rethinking the way we actually design streets holistically. There was a conversation going on in the chat while Sally was speaking about um, trees and drainage, which are constantly in conflict when we have positive drainage with pipes mm. and gullies. Um, but when we start thinking about integrated suds drainage with trees, a lot of those problems kind of go away. So I think there's, as we said with, with um, Jim's presentation, there are solutions there. Yeah. We just need yeah. to try and find them. Mm. I, I think I think the elephant, from the transport point of view, the elephant in the room is, reducing private motor traffic use if you can take some space away from the cars <laughs> you can do so much with it but that is that is very difficult um and that is that's the really hard thing to do and to, to get um to, to get that pushed through but there's it, 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 you it know the solutions the solutions to most problems as you say there are ways through these things but it's yeah not underestimating how hard it can be but as, i mean i think as you pointed out sally at the moment we're starting our, our design of new developments with the road with the car <laughs> And then mm, we're exactly. adding things on and building yeah. out. And maybe we need to step back and look at it from another yeah. way. Um, so I'm now um, going to yeah. pass on to Sue and Emma for specific questions for Sally. OK, I'll start. Um, so th there have been a lot of good chat and we will save the chat and circulate it because there's some good comments made by people. Um, one of the things that's come up, we've, we've all mentioned, sorry, I must look the right way, COVID's been sort of mentioned um, a few times because we had that great burst of mm. needing to make more space for people. So yeah. how did we reconsider our streets, which is sort of actually makes me think, well, that's really what we're talking about with healthy streets or what I'd like to see with manual for streets. But mm. um, are we seeing this enthusiasm to reuse our street space differently that people embraced then and got out in the street and walked in the street because that's their only time they got outside. Are we seeing a sort of mm. pullback from that? Is it actually the sort of thing that's going in practice? Because that links a I, bit to a question that Simon Kahn mm. raised about, you know, the conflict with space mm, and absolutely. people do love their cars. Yeah, they do. It's, um, I think the picture's is a little bit unclear. What's been interesting is um, we did, the department did some public opinion work and some, some surveys and, and research, which showed that by and large, you know, the majority of people were in favour of doing this, of giving more space to, to walking and cycling. There's been a very, very noisy backlash from a, from a vocal minority, um, which we totally did not expect 
um, and it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> Find ourselves in the middle of a culture war about low traffic neighbourhoods is an odd experience. Um, but um, I think there's a lot of lessons learned from, from that time. I think we learned that you can do things in a different way and in an innovative way, but you have to bring communities with you. Um, and doing things very quickly because it had to be done quickly, you know, it was the nature of the, of, of the situation, did mean that um, people felt that they hadn't been consulted, that they hadn't been, you know, informed. So, and it's it's something that we, I, we'd always been aware of even before COVID is the need to engage properly with communities. It's, it, you know, it too often, I think that doesn't happen as well as it could do. So sort of going out to people and saying, it's your street, how do you, you know, what are the things you want to, to do here and how do you want to sort of live and um, live and use this, live in and use this space and doing that at a meaningful point. You know, if you do that, you get to the end, people are, if they don't like it, they at least might accept it. <laughs> mm. So, you know, certainly the, the government has capitalised on that time very much, you know, with the, with the um, reallocation of road space guidance and then gear change and so on. You know, that's definitely the space where, where it's going to be in. How it comes out in the wash as to, you know, how much of a pullback there is, is going to be an interesting one to keep an eye on. No, that, that's really